Chapter Twenty Eight of the Adventures of Captain Hatteras, Part One, The English at the North Pole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Adventures of Captain Hatteras, Part One. The English at the North Pole by Jules Verne. Chapter twenty eight. Preparations for departure. Hatteras would not inform his crew of their situation, for if they had known that they had been dragged farther north, they would very likely have given themselves up to the madness of despair. The captain had hidden his own emotions at his discovery. It was his first happy moment during the long months passed in struggling with the elements. He was a hundred and fifty miles farther north, scarcely eight degrees from the pole. But he hid his delight so profoundly that even the doctor did not suspect it. He wondered at seeing an unwanted brilliancy in the captain's eyes, but that was all, and he never once thought of the reason. The forward, by getting nearer the pole, had got farther away from the coal repository observed by Sir Edward Belcher. Instead of one hundred, it lay at two hundred and fifty miles farther south. However, after a short discussion about it between Hatteras and Clawbonny, the journey was persisted in. If Belcher had written the truth, and there was no reason for doubting his veracity, they should find things exactly in the same state as he had left them, for no new expedition had gone to these extreme continents since 1853. There were few or no Eskimo to be met with in that latitude. They could not be disappointed on the coast of New Cornwall as they had been on Beachy Island. The low temperature preserves the objects abandoned to its influence for any length of time. All probabilities were therefore in favour of this excursion across the ice. It was calculated that the expedition would take, at the most, forty days, and Johnson's preparations were made in consequence. The sledge was his first care. It was in the Greenland style. 35 inches wide and 24 feet long. The Eskimo often make them more than 50 feet long. This one was made of long planks, bent up front and back, and kept bent like a bow by two thick cords. The form thus given to it gave it increased resistance to shocks. It ran easily on the ice, but when the snow was soft on the ground, it was put upon a frame. To make it glide more easily, it was rubbed, Eskimo fashion, with sulphur and snow. Six dogs drew it. Notwithstanding their leanness, these animals did not appear to suffer from the cold. Their buckskin harness was in good condition, and they could draw a weight of two thousand pounds without fatigue. The materials for encampment consisted of a tent, should the construction of a snow house be impossible, a large piece of mackintosh to spread over the snow to prevent it melting in contact with the human body, and lastly several blankets and buffalo skins. They took the Halkett boat too. The provisions consisted of five cases of pemmican, weighing about 450 pounds. They counted one pound of pemmican for each man and each dog. There were seven dogs, including Dick, and four men. They also took 12 gallons of spirits of wine, that is to say about 150 pounds weight, a sufficient quantity of tea and biscuit, a portable kitchen with plenty of wicks, oakum, powder, ammunition, and two double-barreled guns. 
They also used Captain Parry's invention of India rubber belts, in which the warmth of the body and the movement of walking keeps tea, coffee and water in a liquid state. Johnson was very careful about the snowshoes. They are a sort of wooden pattern, fastened on with leather straps. When the ground was quite hard and frozen, they could be replaced by buckskin moccasins. Each traveller had two pairs of both. These preparations were important, for any detail omitted might occasion the loss of an expedition. They took four whole days. Each day at noon, Hatteras took care to set the position of his ship. They had ceased to drift. He was obliged to be certain in order to get back. He next set about choosing the men he should take with him. Some of them were not fit either to take or leave, but the captain decided to take none but sure companions as the common safety depended upon the success of the excursion. Shandon was, therefore, excluded, which he did not seem to regret. James Wall was ill in bed. The state of the sick got no worse, however, and as the only thing to do for them was to rub them with lime juice and give them doses of it, the doctor was not obliged to stop and he made one of the travellers. Johnson very much wished to accompany the captain in his perilous enterprise, but Hatteras took him aside, and said, in an affectionate tone, Johnson, I have confidence in you alone. You are the only officer in whose hands I can leave my ship. I must know that you are there to overlook Shandon and the others. They are kept prisoners here by the winter, but I believe them capable of anything. You will be furnished with my formal instructions, which, in case of need, will give you the command. You will take my place entirely. Our absence will last four or five weeks at the most. I shall not be anxious, knowing you are where I cannot be. You must have wood, Johnson, I know but as far as possible, spare my poor ship. Do you understand me, Johnson? Yes, sir, answered the old sailor. I'll stop if you wish. Thank you, said Hatteras, shaking the boatswain's hand. And if we don't come back, wait for the next breaking up time and try to push forward towards the pole. But if the others won't go, don't mind us and take the forward back to England. Are those your last commands, Captain? Yes, my express commands, answered Hatteras. Very well, sir, they shall be carried out, said Johnson simply. The doctor regretted his friend, but he thought Hatteras had acted wisely in leaving him. Their other two travelling companions were Bell the carpenter and Simpson. The former was in good health, brave and devoted, and was the right man to render service during the encampments on the snow. Simpson was not so sure, but he accepted a share in the expedition, and his hunting and fishing capabilities might be of the greatest use. The expedition consisted, therefore, of four men, Hatteras, Clawbonny, Bell and Simpson and seven dogs. The provisions had been calculated in consequence. During the first days of January, the temperature kept at an average of 33 degrees below zero. Hatteras was very anxious for the weather to change. He often consulted the barometer, but it is of little use in such high latitudes. A clear sky in these regions does not always bring cold, and the snow does not make the temperature rise. The barometer is uncertain. It goes down with the north and east winds. Low, it brought fine weather. High, snow or rain. Its indications could not therefore be relied upon. 
At last, on January the 5th, the mercury rose to 18 degrees below zero, and Hatteras resolved to start the next day. He could not bear to see his ship burnt piece by piece before his eyes. All the poop had gone into the stove. On the 6th, then, in the midst of whirlwinds of snow, the order for departure was given. The doctor gave his last orders about the sick. Bell and Simpson shook hands silently with their companions. Hatteras wished to say his goodbyes aloud, but he saw himself surrounded by evil looks and thought he saw Shandon smile ironically. He was silent, and perhaps hesitated for an instant about leaving the forward. But it was too late to turn back. The loaded sledge, with the dog's harness to it, awaited him on the ice field. Bell started the first, the others followed. Johnson accompanied the travellers for a quarter of a mile, then Hatteras begged him to return on board, and the old sailor went back after making a long farewell gesture. At that moment Hatteras turned a last look towards the brig, and saw the extremity of her masts disappear in the dark clouds of the sky. End of chapter 28 Recording by Steve Chilvers, Norwich, England